Good morning, everybody, and welcome to the We Are Melomaniacs podcast. Today, I'm bringing to you Eric, founder, frontman, solo artist of Aerial Ruin. His music transcends more than just the human condition. It's a bit of a journey in ways that I have a hard time explaining and understanding because I'm still trying to figure things out in life and death. With that being said, his music has a way of gripping you and bringing you down to a very humbling level. And it very much makes you question maybe your life choices or just the fabric of life itself. We all have lows. We all have highs. And your music really puts all that into perspective. So... I'm going to throw it at you and have you explain to everyone here that of which I just tried my best to explain about your music and the journey that it kind of takes you on. Well, yeah. Cheers, David. Uh, thanks for having me on. Really appreciate it. Um, and yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a good way to sort of start uh, explaining uh, music. It's definitely sort of a, a journey and it's definitely got a, a lot of highs and lows and, you know, um, it is, uh, Aerial Ruin is kind of, uh, it's a sort of a spiritual expression. Um, it sort of, you know, I, um, was certainly very fond of altering my consciousness and psychedelic variations, uh, in my, uh, younger years and, you know, certainly in the present day to a certain extent as well. Um, and I had, uh, some extreme experiences that, um, in retrospect, when I wrote the first sort of early material of Aerial Ruin, it was um, when I looked back on it, like I sort of, you know, it's a very stream of consciousness at the time, but then it sort of felt like it was very much expressing this sort of loss of the self or the fine line between, um, you know, the ultra sort of personal and then that sort of, you know, slip on to the other side of the, uh, uh, you know, ego death experience where you're still seeing things. Um, but without the filter of the human ego. Um, at least I like to think that that's uh, what it might be expressing. And then it's expressing a lot of different things, you know, that kind of uh, rotate around that sort of core. And it sometimes it dips back up into the more human experience and expresses things there. But it's mostly about the escape of the human experience in a uh, somewhat spiritual fashion. And dynamically, it's, you know, primarily acoustic guitar and vocals, lots of layering on the vocals sometimes um, with a little bit of electric guitar and then the occasional guest collaborator, but mostly just me. I want to dive into the death of the ego because I've been talking a lot about this lately. I've talked a lot about how I spent most of my life chasing my ego while trying to prove to other people I was something more than their perception of useless, scrawny, weak weak-minded, you know, child boy thing. Um, so talk about that. Where did that whole death of the ego come from for you? Well, I think, I think I've always been, I've always been a very dreamy person. Like even as a kid, I was just very dreamy and have, I've never had any real sense of sort of competition, you know, um, uh, like, I. I've always just been sort of in my own little world and um, sort of eccentric in that fashion, I suppose. So as a you know teenager and then later as an adult, I think the, the psychedelic state of mind was very natural extension of just, you know, my kind of psyche and personality to begin with. Um, but I think that the things that inspired Aerial Ruin was when I started to sort of look at spirituality in a different way and look at life in a different way because of these experiences instead of just sort of doing it for like a you know somewhat childish feeling of getting kicks out of it you know what i mean like um when it started to mean something to me like i was very agnostic um for you know uh the early phase of of, of that experience but then when i sort of had this kind of spiritual awakening that eventually led to aerial ruin, it really changed that and it kind of deepened um, those experiences for me. And it became part of this journey, I suppose. It's, uh, yeah, you know, it's like, it's the type of thing, I think that 
psychedelia and spirituality are the type of thing that, you know, language kind of just flows off of. You know, there's a quote from a book about the history of LSD that I have up there somewhere that says, so something exactly like that, you know, that like psychedelia is a an experience that language just sort of flows on top of and over and it can't really describe. So not that it's all about psychedelia for me, but I think that, you know, you can kind of, you can talk about something that can't be talked about and you can write lyrics about something that can't be written about um, in a way that sort of creates a feeling you know, and that's sort of what music's about too, right? It's about establishing a feeling, you know, that is sort of, you know, beyond language. But then it's really fun to use language to sort of increase that feeling, even if you can't be literal with it, if that makes any sense. I think I have a grasp on that. And I I, I really like that, actually. Um, it, life is more than just what we see, feel, smell there's a whole nother layer to it hence that spirituality aspect of living life and eventually dying i've talked about this as well in previous um, pods about my spiritual journey where as a young child i was kind of indifferent and then i was pushed into the churches to believe in you know baptism and you know standard christianity as people know it today and the church had a wonderful way of showing me just how uh, man-made uh, these religions really are. And I spent years calling myself an atheist um, when really it was just me trying to label myself with a term to fit in somewhere. And then as I just became more self-aware, I became more aware of life outside of you know me. And that's when I got into the whole idea that we're all energy and we're all like part of the universe. So the universal aspect of living, I could see how that would be enhanced through psychedelics. Um, I gotta ask like, what is that for you, that, that spiritual aspect of things? Talk to me a little bit more about that. I feel like you just kind of glanced over it. Well, yeah, I mean, I think that that's a, um, it's, you know, I think that there's a difference between spirituality and religion, right? Sure. I mean, very much so. There's obviously a huge overlap. There's elements that are both religious and, but but as when I was saying that, like you know, you can't really express uh, the true, like you know, true spirituality or psychedelia for that matter with language completely. You know, not you can't do it directly and literally the way you can try to describe, you know, someone with a green hat walking down the street, you right? Know? Um, well, I think with what religion does is it attempts to do that. It put these these you know um, ideas that you know are much bigger than the human experience and transcend the human experience. The, you know the perhaps the human is some sort of an extension of, and that tries to put it into a somewhat you know kind of mythic fairy tale type of a thing that we can understand, and then. You know, sometimes within history, like used to manipulate people, like in mm -hmm. cynical ways, actually have nothing to do with spirituality, right? But um, but then I think you have truly spiritual people who are also religious that maybe look at these stories and the, the tales and the myths within, you know, their religions as more of a way of speaking about, you know, their spirituality the same way that I'm kind of talking about it. That it's if there's truth there, it's same sort of literal truth of you know talking about it, describing a person walking down the street with a green hat you know i like this um, green hat thing yeah if that if uh any sense you feel free to ask me to expand on on, on that thought but um that's oh, sort of i'm a, i'm very interested in this keep going if you have more to expand on expand away i'm i'm digging this i like where this whole this is one of my favorite things to talk about because it's highly misunderstood and it's also can be kind of hard to grasp. You got people who are firm believers in religion and can't see outside of what religion tells them. And then you have people who are more spiritual and they also have a hard time with the religious side of things. You know, like I've experienced both and there are people out there are hard left, hard, right. No political affiliations there. I'm simply referring to religious and spiritual. Um, there is a crossover and I think you're right. Religion does try to take it. 
I feel like religion more or less corrupts spirituality, in, in my opinion. So go ahead and elaborate. I'm curious here. Yeah, well, I think, I mean, yeah, I think, I think that um, it is a tool of manipulation, but that doesn't necessarily mean that like all religious people are manipulated or be, or manipulating others. That, there's not huge, Agreed. you know, groups within the Christian community or the Muslim community or any other, you know, traditionally religious community that are not practicing a profound and deep and beautiful you know, religious, you know, experience within their daily lives and enriching it and everything. 100%. But, but I think from like, yeah, from a conceptual standpoint, it's using, it's, you know, I I believe like, you know, if, if I'm correct in believing that there is something beyond this life, that this is just sort of a sort of strange offshoot of a larger consciousness, then I think that like, it's impossible for, you know, you and I in our current human forms to like, you know, fully understand that from where we're at, you know, and I think that religion is an attempt to do that. Like I was saying before, like it dresses up these um, ideas that are too big for us to grasp into something, you know, simple, like a simple story. Yeah. And, you know, the idea of heaven and hell and, you know, and, and, and all this kind of stuff, you know? Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, I think it's, I think it's, um, I think when I have felt my connection with spirituality, it's sort of like, it's, it feels sort of like revelatory. And then you're like in the, you know, you're in the presence of something that is larger than yourself. And, and when you're there, you can second guess yourself. Like you, I, you know, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that this, my human body and consciousness is all there is. And when I die, it's all over. I do accept that to an extent, but when I'm having those, when I'm there with it, I feel like I know, or I do know, you know, and those experiences was what like, you know, changed me to begin with. And that sort of led me down this path. And then, and then, you know, wanted me, led me to start the Ariel Ruin project as sort of a way to sort of express that, you know, continuously. How so there, you... there's never there's never a need to sort of try to change my lyrical direction. Gotcha. You know, it's naturally within that scope, um, and it sort of progresses musically. But I'm never trying to like write an album about anything different because it's just an expression of of this experience of mine that we're talking about. You know, which is you know obviously something shared in you know by by all of humanity extent or another everybody not everybody but so many people have spiritual experiences and they just express them in different ways and this is just my way i suppose i love it how do you this how do you express all of that that mind that mindset in your music is it more lyrical or do you find to be more instrumental like do you find that you are better expressed through one or the other or in the combination of i i think it's definitely both um mm -hmm. arch musically like i just sort of you know i just sort of start playing or i get a vocal melody in my head and then um i'll usually kind of come up with a song and then i have like the i you know i have those sort of guitar parts and then i have the vocal melody and i have like a sort of you know improvised version of the lyrics you know and then within that certain phrases start to sort of pop up and then i kind of rewrite it and rewrite it and rewrite it and by the time i record an album version it's been sort of you know gone over many many times you know but it starts with the feeling of the music itself you know it's never like okay i want to write a song about this topic it's more like it just starts with the feeling uh, with the music and it's a feeling that is the same feeling or a different variety of the same feeling that all my other songs are and then it kind of just you know it you know it becomes the song first and then i'll fill in the more specific words later having said that there is um certain times when you know a more specific theme sometimes a more human theme will actually uh uh evolve there's a uh a song called the fray on nameless sun which is actually specifically sort of about overcoming depression like a, a lot more uh and that's probably the, one of the most you know human experience type of songs that, that i've had um that i've actually released so far 
So that's an example of that. But um, how did that song come about, if you don't mind me asking? Well, that was a very, I think that was just a, that's a very simple one. Um, uh, and it just came up and yeah, it wasn't really super connected to the rest of the album. And then I just went into the studio, my friend's home studio, Lot 3 Audio, where I record my albums. And then I just laid down what was supposed to be like a rough version of this idea, you know, and that I would go back and redo later. And it just, you know, the first take just sounded really good. Like it's pretty raw, but and it doesn't have any overdubs or anything like that. And it's really short. Um, but it just kind of like there was just something about it, you know. And um, I actually had the lyrics written because I was just sort of, you know, I was thinking about that you know, coming to depression and, and within the sort of aerial ruin kind of general context, you know, um, like it's not a sort of day-to-day -day human experience, lyrical type of stuff. It's still sort of very, you know, metaphoric and weird and, you know, um, drifty and spiritual sounding. It's definitely more about that than, than most of my songs are. Um, Your songs sense. have a way of they grabbed me. I wasn't a hundred percent sure what you were singing about when I first heard you. Um, and I was telling you before the show, like I wasn't really feeling like acoustic music when I found you, I was hard into like discovering black metal. I was still trying to find my grounding there. Um, I had heard a little bit of folky metal before and I was like, all right, cool. But then I came across your stuff, which was strictly acoustic and I was just like, holy fuck, it's poetry, man. And I wasn't even 100% sure what you were singing about. I actually thought a lot of what you were singing about was more seasonal at the time, like very focused on earth and nature and things of th things of that nature. And I guess I could see how I pull that from it, even without the words, if you're he so heavily focused on the spiritual out, out spiritual aspect of life. I guess it kind of plays in, in tandem with each other. Um, why the music did that to me, which is fucking cool that it did that. And I was actually wrong. Was I wrong? Completely wrong about. Well, no, I, mean, I don't think so. I think, I think that the, you know, I think that the lyrics are so, you know what I mean? It's not an attempt to have a narrative. It's, okay. it's more of just a stream of consciousness sort of expression of a feeling, mm -hmm. you know, of this, you know, the spiritual, I don't know. It's like I said, yeah, it's a constant sort of spiritual expression, you know? Um, uh, and so, like I was saying, that like you can't really, in my opinion, I can't really, ex I can't really describe what I feel the spirit is or the, ex you know, uh, you know, um, in a literal direct way. So it's like a lot of like the stuff is, it's sort of like, you know, you just, I just kind of get into this mind and I, I, I sort of imagine this sort of drifting around of sort of sometimes earthly landscapes. And then it's sometimes, you know, ascending into the heavens or, you know, I'm, I'm also very interested in astronomy and do, into sci-fi and fantasy and stuff. So it's like, you know, there's, there's a lot of, um, a lot of it is sort of like disembodied spirit kind of drifting around type of lyrics. If you look at it from the most like literal, uh, feeling of like what the, uh, um, you know what the words are saying like on the most sort of fundamental sense so i think there is a lot of you know earthen references and a lot of seasonal references and okay i don't think that any of that interpretation is wrong at all like it's the type of music where like there's it's hard for me to say that anyone would interpret it in a wrong way if they're enjoying it you know because i think that it's more based on a, a feeling than it is an attempt to communicate an idea or a narrative you know I like so that. you know unless it's like someone completely got it wrong and they interpreted <laughs> you know uh, political way that i completely disagreed with or something then <laughs> outside of that like i don't really think there is an incorrect interpretation that makes any sense no that makes total sense and i'm glad that you elaborated on that because for a second i was like damn i totally like we did discuss your music some but i still felt like i was getting this seasonal vibe like i've read I've listened to this interview a while ago where um, the two were talking about uh, it was an Anthony Robbins interview uh, and he was talking about the seasons of life, how just like earth has, has winter, spring, summer, and fall, our lives have it too. Um, 
and you know, society has its version of it. That's usually offset from your seasons. And when I was listening to music, I just felt like I was going through the seasons of my life. Like I, I, I felt like I was very connected to earth and I felt like I was very distant from earth at the same time, but I was living my life and experiencing that the warmth that summer brings and and the depression that winter can bring. And, you know, it was just like this cool spiritual journey that I got out of it, but very earth laden or out there from space downward looking in. Um, but that's the uh, reincarnation of aspect from me. Cause I believe heavily that once like energy can't be destroyed and it can't be uh, built. Uh, I think that's how I wanted to say that uh, created, excuse me. It can't be created. It can't be destroyed. And Right. I just find that I I feel like, you know, when I die, my body, my consciousness might go away, but my energy is going to go somewhere else, whether it becomes a tree or fucking caterpillar. Or I don't know what, you know, maybe I'll become a flying ant. Uh, but I feel like that energy gets recycled through earth and and the universe. And, you know, the more I, I read, because I go on these like tandems, especially late at night when I can't sleep um, because my brain won't, won't shut down and I don't necessarily want to do like work because sometimes I want to get creative, but other times I want to learn. And one of the things I like to learn about is the universe, like the beginning of when time started and, you know, uh, things like that. Like before time, there was still space. There just wasn't space in time. And I like to dig into crazy things like that, that are very hard for our mind to grasp. And it makes me question life, not my life so much, as much as life in general, like how fortunate we are that we have a consciousness and we're able to think and we're able to rationalize and interpret as best as we can. But then we also misinterpret. And for things that we don't understand that are supernatural, we try to make them natural, which is where that whole concept of religion comes into play. They were trying to make a, something that's supernatural natural so our brains can understand it because there's so much that we can't make sense of. Like It's hard to fathom life before time. It's hard to fathom an infinitely growing space. It's hard to yeah. fathom our bodies dying, but yet our our life, our energy is still living. There's just, it blows my fucking mind. And sometimes I wish I could just sit down and eat a bag of shrooms and figure this stuff out, but I can't. Because um, <laughs> I know I'd fucking come up with the answer to life if I could eat a bag of shrooms. <laughs> At least that's what I've been told. Um, anyways, <laughs> um, I love it when I go off topic like that, but have some fun with it. Uh, but I'm serious. I was serious about everything I just said. <laughs> Uh, all of it. Um, you know, trying to I mean, think. that's the thing. It's like, you know, like, so I think one of these religions were invented, there wasn't, didn't really have science. So no. it was like, it was, it was like, you know, it's like they were answering the, the questions that science is involved in answering now. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's all wrapped up together. And now religions are in this modern world where we have all these scientific answers and religion is trying to figure out how to grapple with that and what we know that contradicts what, you know, religion used to answer in lieu of science. Science has definitely done some pretty cool things to show us, you know, I mean, yeah, I, I, about I, the astronomy and the big bang and, and everything. I mean, what we know is just, I mean, it, it's, it's, it may be outweighed by what we don't know, but what we know is fucking incredible. You know, I mean, just the fact that we are animals on this world right now and that we have access to all that knowledge. And it's like, you know, just yeah, takes back a few hundred years, and we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't have that sense of privilege uh, intellectually. I'm watching a documentary with my family. Um, it's about uh, like the evolution of life on Earth, and it it goes through the five extinction events. It goes through the different periods in time. You know, before Pangaea. You know, it talks about other supercontinents, and you know, the it's just it it talks about how much our earth has changed and how these different extinction events led to the next evolution of something and how if every, if not, if each of these extinction events hadn't happened the way they happened in that order at those times, humankind would never have existed. And it's just crazy. Like how right. um, it's almost like a lottery. Like we bitch about not being able to win the lottery, but we kind of did like every time I spend 20 bucks and go out to play the fucking lotto, I'm like, fuck, I didn't win, but I did because I'm here I'm living in what is essentially the lotto of life. Like I get a consciousness, even though it's a short period of time, I get this consciousness and I get to chill and I get to l breathe in these things and see the snowy mountains and just feel everything that living has to offer you. And 
it's crazy because even though I have this high level of respect and gratitude for living, I have days where I'm like, fuck, can I just die already? You know? <laughs> yeah. We're, I think we all go, like, you know, it's a question of uh, how often and how deep, you know, <laughs> yeah, mine, mine go pretty deep. Um, You know, thankfully I've, I've gotten to the point now where it's like, I'm, I'm self-aware enough that I can stop the thoughts from tanking and I can, I, I will still have that feeling, but I'm able to counter it. And I usually like I counter it and I know it's what this, I counter it with fucking music. I counter it with hiking. I counter it with just being outside. I like to take my feet and dig them into the ground outside and like dig my toes into the ground. And if I have some music playing in the background, even fucking better. So yeah. That's, that's yeah. my little journey. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah, that's like, you know, um, yeah, it's like depression is like, you know, it's just like a thing that, you know, I think it's just everybody experiences it. It's just a question of how much and how often. And then, you know, that's not to compare every day in and out sort of depression with serious clinical depression or like, you know, suicidal depression and all that kind of stuff. But, you know, it's like, I think it's just a sort of universal constant that doesn't get talked about that much. I mean, it does get talked about a lot in certain circles and yeah. that's cool that you're doing this podcast and, you know, kind of tying it in with, you know, creative musical expression and, and stuff. So, you know, trying to anyways, I mean, it, it gets complicated at times. It's hard, you know, cause I am fighting my own battle every time I try to step on here and do this. Uh, it definitely, uh, it weighs on me at times, but at the end of the day, it's these little victories, these little moments in life that I truly do enjoy that keep me grounded and keep, and I'm like I was saying earlier, like I'm able to, I'm self-aware enough to where I can look back and go, okay, I got this. And these are things I get to look forward to. And sometimes it's as simple as just being outside and seeing a beautiful fucking landscape. Like the other day I walked out, it was 630 in the morning. We had a nice hard frost. It was almost like the earth had this like dusting of snow, but it was perfect. And the air was the perfect temperature. It was like 28 outside. God, it was like, I just stood there and I just stared off into the countryside where I live. And I'm like, Holy fuck. Yeah. And then I actually played, uh, I actually played, um, the fuck was that album? Um, it was Panopticon's, uh, fuck. It's the one with, uh, it's the double album, the acoustic. And then the, the, uh, the more traditional black metal one. Yeah. Scars. Uh, scars one and two. Yes. Scars. Thank you. That I played that on the way to work and it just fit the moment, man. But, um, back on the topic, not that that was off topic, but back onto a more direct topic. Um, with the latest album, did you ever find any moments in there where it just wasn't flowing and you kind of like, I don't know, like, did it, did it flow? Like talk, I guess what I'm asking is, did that album come to you with that traditional stream of consciousness and just flow from start to finish, or were there some hiccups along the way? And I asked that because when you listen to well, the album, um, it's go ahead. No, sorry. Finish your thought. <laughs> no. Um, all I was going to say is I only asked that because it's such a consistent album and it feels like a concept album from start to finish. Like, I feel like if you play one song out of sequence, you, you miss the journey. You miss that. You miss that scenic view. So that's why I was asking. Yeah, no, that's that's actually that's that's uh, that's a uh, an apt observation, and I uh, thank you for that because um I think you understand something about the record um, um by doing that. So like conceptually, it's like it's sort of again like it's the same sort of area of ruin exploration, but like I kind of like framed it in the concept of like walking a path. You know, the path is sort of the metaphor, but then the path may explode into the sky, so to speak. And it does that in a sort of dramatic fashion in the first song. And then the um the second song, um uh um the protagonist, so to speak, finds uh a a hundred year old book called The Prophet and reads a couple of verses and then and then sort of thinks about it in the third verse. And so I'm actually quoting an author there. Um, for, and I've never done that before, but it's sort of like within the context of, you know, what is a very typical aerial ruin journey. And then the third song is reflecting on that. And then the, the fourth song is very long, which is a, um, 
a uh, musical collaboration with Andrea Morgan from um, Excellences. Um, uh, then the, you know, path sort of explodes into space, so to speak, you know. Um, but anyway, I don't think that was quite what you asked me. You were asking me about whether it was a, a, if I got sort of hung up on the writing process or what have you. And I think that basically, like, it's it's basically, I'm just always kind of writing and recording demos and then going to my friend Lot 3 to record the official versions. And it's like, you know, um, it's, it's a sort of constantly going in and like just deciding what's going to end up on a record type of a thing. But then the thing about this record is, is that it got a lot of it was written and recorded like during 2020 and then like early 20, 2021 during like lockdown and everything. So it was a little bit more concentrated um, and a little bit less spread out as far as like the uh, writing and recording went. So maybe that was why the specific sort of path um, kind of metaphor led throughout the whole thing. It really did just feel right. So I actually had a larger amount of material, and then I didn't include a couple of songs that may end up on future releases, because um, I'm also thinking about format and stuff. And, you know, like I, I tend to like single LPs, like with for vinyl releases, so I'm always thinking about <laughs> sort of a 40 to 44 minutes or something, you know? Um, so then I, I I left a couple of songs that I, I recorded and, and demoed off of it, that are that may end up on the next album or maybe in on EP or something like that. Um, but yeah, I think that by the time all the lyrics and everything were done, like it was pretty perfect uh, in its uh, in its conception. So yeah, I think it's more the opposite with this one. It's really that there was more material um, uh, as opposed to like having a hiccups of like you know what to include and what not to include. That makes any sense. It does. And thank you for the download, by the way. And I'm excited to get the vinyl. Usually I like to show off the vinyls uh, that I get, but mine hasn't gotten here yet, guys. Uh, but when it does, I'm going to be so happy. Um, so I like to talk about the songs you picked for the end of the album. You actually gave me two and I listened to them both. And I almost feel like I need to just play like part of me is like, shit, they need to hear the whole album. But then I'm like, I got to pick one because if I do two, it's an injustice to the entire album because they need that whole ride. So I, th I think I'm going to run with the epic at the end. So it's a nice, like just 20, I think 21 minutes and 40 something second long song. And it's just so fucking great. It's like the Iliad, but metal. You want to play ideation, the 20, the 20 minute song. Is that the second? Is that the one that you um offered up? Because that was what I remembered uh the uh, looking at. Because hang on one second here, uh, we only had a brief concept. I was reading when I was driving, yeah, which I shouldn't have been I doing. Where Sky Lay is buried, which is the opening track, which is like a little less than nine minutes. For gotcha. The, for the flames intent, which is uh um um about seven minutes. Right. So for whatever reason, I think because when I read it, it's the you said more impressive song with epic kind of epic i immediately just went oh the last song even though it says where sky so i was like oh i'm gonna play the last one but if you want to play the last one that's that's fine with me i mean but that is like that's a whole that's like almost half of the record you know oh, i love <laughs> it though that's what i love about it like it's just like this it's the entire third act and it just it's amazing um but I'll stick true to what you requested because well, no, it was your choice. That, yeah, whatever you're feeling, um, I just don't know if you're. Uh, I'm feeling the whole damn album. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, no, let's roll with the. Flames I think where the path sort of like floats into space, and that's like, and also like it has Andrea Morgan playing all those awesome violin parts that you know she really kind of you know like I I wrote the song independently of her, but then would just send her the parts, and then she would just come up with her own parts. Like I was just like kind of just do what you want here. And I was like, you know, like, yeah, really spacey, weird, ethereal layered shit. And, you know, and then we would talk back and forth, but she very much wrote her own parts. And so like, like what she did on that piece is, is, is incredible. So it's if you have a crazy. Out, uh, excellence has just uh, put out two new records um, uh, on blind room recordings. And uh, one of them is like sort of a more black metal record. And one of them is a more folky record. And they're both really great. So um, yeah. Cheers to, Cheers to Andrea and uh, uh, Excellences and and Andrea's playing on ideation. Yeah, it's kind of next level as far as like just oh God, like I can't sit here and explain it. It's just too damn good. Like 
I'm, I'm probably gonna listen to it again before I go to bed. Like I just really want to sit down with my headphones on because I hadn't listened with my headphones on. I like to get lost. I was like plop and get lost in it. Like the, thing about the first song is that um, it's sort of like its own. That's what I was saying. It's like it's it's like it's mini epic. It's kind of like a self-contained smaller epic. Mm-hmm. Ideation. What you're talking about, the 20 minute song is like a big epic, mm-hmm. but. The, the opening song is like a mini uh, sort of a smaller epic where it kind of goes through all this stuff and since it's the first part of the journey you can sort of experience that and then if you don't hear the rest of the record then you just kind of want to just go hear it you know whereas if you listen right. to any other songs out of context mm-hmm. then you're like already in the journey so to speak all but right. that's just a conceptual uh distinction you know and- i'm not sure what that means to like you know the casual listener that may not have, have heard area around before <laughs> oh it's okay i think what we'll do is is we'll go ahead and showcase the flames intent because you're right they need to get they need that that introduction i'm trying to throw them right yeah, at the end with our wife's where sky lays buried that's the first song if you want the introduction so uh, go with the word Third song. Dude, it's the way so i'm getting them all fucked up because <laughs> the Rich way you're like referring to like a text conversation or... <laughs> yeah, yeah man this is what i get for doing my research while when i shouldn't be doing my research so yeah we'll uh we'll go with the mini epic <laughs> fuck, <man. laughs> i guess you can always edit some of those out <laughs> no fuck that this is half the fun i i love the, the like people need to see that shit's not smooth like it it's everything's bumpy like i don't like it like honestly like it like it drives me mad like the filters we put on everything and how yeah. clean cut everything is like i want people to see the podcast for what it is shitty lighting uh fucking unshaved fucking nose hairs coming out whatever fucking just unpolished unedited i mean the only thing i edit is i have my editor aaron rigney uh load the intro he'll cut out anything that we decide we decided we really didn't want to have on air like I have people sometimes go say something like shit, maybe we should take that out. Um, and I go, I take it out. You know, we don't want to put our feet in our mouth, you know, intentionally all the time, you know, and then add in the songs and make it. So it sounds fairly decent on YouTube and Spotify. Uh, I try to keep everything else in there. Cause it's, it's part of the podcast. It's part of the journey. It's life. Like yeah. people need to see that shit's not perfect. So just like this, you know, like I fuck things up. Dude, I mispronounced my own podcast name for the first two episodes. Like who the fuck does that? <laughs> and I'm not going to change it. <laughs> so, oh, look, we are. <laughs> uh, well, I was calling it the, uh, we are melomanic and it's, we are melomaniacs. And it, it can't, cause my original idea was melomanic. Uh, and then for some reason I sent it to my artist and I wrote melomaniac. So when he sent it back, I was like, I had said the two things. He's actually the one that hit me up. My boy Sumo from San Diego. He's like, bro, you, uh, he's like, dude, you, uh, you, you told me to write melomaniac and you're calling it melomanic. I'm like, fuck. Well, we're sticking with the logo. It's melomaniac. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> that's cool, actually. That's that's yeah. how my that's how my shit got named. Um, yeah. Is it? Yeah, dude, it's fucking. I love it. So, anyways, um, so is there anything else you wanna you wanna drop in here before we call it quits, buddy? Um, no, not really. Um, uh, yeah, working on on you know new stuff and uh, um, working on the next Stygian Bow record slowly but surely, which we're gonna record sometime next year, and then. Then we'll be doing a tour cycle for that eventually, and um, I have some other new projects that are kind of in the in the mix. I'm hoping that the next Ariel Ruin album will be completed and out either late next year or the uh, in early 2025, and then maybe an EP before that because there's so much material, and I think that maybe like a low maintenance EP before like the the next album might be a good idea. Um, I love a good EP. Yeah. And yeah, and you know, if you go with White Where Sky Lays Buried for the outro track here, um, then I hope that your listeners will understand that the uh, uh, your listeners slash viewers will understand that you know it's uh like you said, it's like a it's a, it's an album that's supposed to be listened to all the way through. It is a concept album, and that they will do that, and especially get to the epic ideation uh, with Andrea Morgan's awesome violin playing. And uh, yeah, and I would like to say. Uh, Thank you to you, David. Thank Cheers. you, sir. Appreciate your uh, your support and attention and good luck with your future episodes. I appreciate it, man. I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to give the world. So uh, everybody, 
Oh, wait, you need to tell them how to find you and support you, man. You got to. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, aerialruin.bandcamp.com. That's where all my albums are. And that's, you have to spell it correctly, A-E-R-I-A-L. Uh, you know, ruin is, is typical. It's not like the girl's name, Ariel. <laughs> <laughs> I do have some of the albums on like Spotify and Google and Apple Play and all that bullshit. But a lot of them, including the newest one that we're talking about tonight, is only on Bandcamp. It's not, not on uh the evil empire streaming services, as I like to call them. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, uh, as far as social media, I mostly just um, just go through Instagram, where uh, it's just at Ariel Ruin. And um, yeah, uh, yeah, I am on the silly f fucking Facebook and all that poor shit. But you know, <laughs> check yeah. <it> <laughs> <laughs> if anybody if anybody can't find him, feel free to hop onto my Instagram and you can follow him there. He's one of my newest followers. Um, I appreciate that, by the way. It, it's nice to have the people I get on the show and people I have such a high level of respect for and follow me along. It makes me feel good. Uh, it makes it gives me more. It just it just makes me feel fucking good. Like I'm not going to expand on that. Like it feels fucking good. So no. thank you very much. And uh, cheers. I'd throw up a beer, but I'm not drinking. Uh, so you get the horns. Uh, dude, thank you. I'm, I'm going to stop saying thank you now. And uh, stay on after the show and we'll chat for a few minutes. But everybody, have a great night or day or whatever it is you have, time it is you're watching this. Don't forget to subscribe. Spread the fucking word. There's good shit on here. Later, y'all.
Oh uh-huh.